Chapter 11, Quidditch. As they entered November, the weather turned very cold. The mountains around the school became icy grey and the lake like chilled steel. Every morning the ground was covered in frost. Hagrid could be seen from the upstairs windows defrosting broomsticks on the Quidditch pitch, bundled up in a long moleskin overcoat, rabbit fur gloves and enormous beaver skin boots. The Quidditch season had begun. On Saturday, Harry would be playing in his first match after weeks of training. Gryffindor versus Slytherin. If Gryffindor won, they would move up into second place in the house championship. Hardly anyone had seen Harry play because Wood had decided that as their secret weapon, Harry should be kept, well, secret. But the news that he was playing seeker had leaked out somehow, and Harry didn't know which was worse. People telling him he'd be brilliant, or people telling him they'd be running around and nearly thin, holding a mattress. It was really lucky that Harry now had Hermione as a friend. He didn't know how he'd have got through all his homework without her. What with all the last-minute Quidditch practice Wood was making them do. She'd also lent them Quidditch through the ages, which turned out to be a very interesting read. Harry learnt that there were 700 ways of committing a Quidditch foul, and that all of them had happened during a World Cup match in 1473. That Seekers were usually the smallest and fastest players, and that more serious Quidditch accidents seemed to happen to them. That although people rarely died playing Quidditch, referees had been known to vanish and turn up months later in the Sahara Desert. Hermione had become a bit more relaxed about breaking rules since Harry and Ron had saved her from the mountain troll and she was much nicer for it. The day before Harry's first Quidditch match, the three of them were out in the freezing courtyard during break and she had conjured them up a bright blue fire which could be carried around in a jam jar. They were standing with their backs to it getting warm when Snape crossed the yard. Harry noticed at once that Snape was limping. Harry, Ron and Hermione moved closer together to block the fire from view. They were sure it wouldn't be allowed. Unfortunately, something about their guilty faces caught Snape's eye. He limped over. He hadn't seen the fire, but he seemed to be looking for a reason to tell them off anyway. What have you got there, Potter? It was Quidditch through the ages, Harry showed him. Library books are not to be taken outside the school, said Snape. Give it to me, five points from Gryffindor. He's just made that rule up, Harry muttered angrily as Snape limped away. Wonder what's wrong with his leg. Dunno, but I hope it's really hurting him, said Ron bitterly. The Gryffindor common room was very noisy that evening. Harry, Ron and Hermione sat together next to a window. Hermione was checking Harry and Ron's charms homework for them. She would never let them copy. How will you learn? But by asking her to read it through, they got the right answers anyway. Harry felt restless. He wanted Quidditch through the ages back to take his mind off his nerves about tomorrow. Why should he be afraid of Snape? Getting up, he told Ron and Hermione he was going to ask Snape if he could have it. Rather they you than me, they said together. But Harry had an idea that Snape wouldn't refuse if there were other teachers listening. He made his way down to the staff room and knocked. There was no answer. He knocked again. Nothing. Perhaps Snape had left the book in there. It was worth a try. He pushed the door ajar and peered inside, and a horrible scene met his eyes. Snape and Filch were inside, alone. Snape was holding his legs. One of them was bloody and mangled, and Filch was handling, handing Snape bandages. Blasted thing, Snape was saying. How are you supposed to keep your head, your eyes, and all three heads at once? Harry tried to shut the door quietly, but Potter! Snape's face was twisted with fury as he dropped his robes quickly to hide his he leg. Harry gulped. I just wondered if I could have my book back. Get out! Out! Harry left before Snape could take any more points from Gryffindor. He sprinted back upstairs. Did you get it? Ron asked as Harry joined them. What's the matter? In a low whisper, Harry told them what he'd seen. You know what this means, he finished breathlessly. He tried to get past that three-headed dog at Halloween. That's where he was going when we saw him. He's after what Edward's guarding. And I'd bet my broomstick he let the troll in to create a diversion. Hermione's eyes were wide. No, he wouldn't, she said. I know he's not very nice, but he wouldn't try and steal something Dumbledore was keeping safe. Honestly, Hermione, you think all teachers are saints or something, snapped Graham. I'm with Harry. I wouldn't put anything past Snape. But what's he after? What's that dog guarding? Harry went to bed with his head buzzing with the same question. Never was snoring loudly, but Harry couldn't sleep. He tried to empty his mind. He needed to sleep. He had to. He had his first Quidditch match in a few hours, but the expression on Snape's face when Harry had seen his leg was not easy to forget. The next morning dawned very bright and cold. The Great Hall was full of the delicious smell of fried sausages and the cheerful chatter of everyone looking forward to a good Quidditch match. You've got to eat some breakfast. I don't want anything. Just a bit of toast, wheedled Hermione. I'm not hungry. Harry felt terrible. In an hour's time, he'd be walking onto the pitch. Harry, you need your strength, said Seamus Finnegan. Seekers are always the ones who get nobbled by the other team. Thanks, Seamus, said Harry. 
watching she and Miss Pyle catch up on his sausages. By 11 o'clock, the whole school seemed to be out in the stands around the Quidditch pitch. Many qu students had binoculars. The seats might be raised high in the air, but it was still difficult to see what was going on sometimes. Ron and Hermione joined Neville, Seamus and Dean, the West Ham fan, up in the top row. As a surprise for Harry, they had pinned a large banner on one of the sheets. Scavaz had ruined. It had said, Potter for President, and Dean, who was good at drawing, had done a large Gryffindor lion underneath. Then Hermione had performed a tricky little charm so that the paint flashed different colours. Meanwhile, in the changing rooms, Harry and the rest of the team were changing into their scarlet Quidditch robes. Slytherin would be playing in green. Wood cleared his throat for silence. OK, men, he said. And women, said Chaser Angelina Johnson. And women, Wood agreed. This is it. The big one, said Fred Weasley. The one we've all been waiting for, said George. We know all of our speech by heart, Fred told Harry. We were in the team last year. Shut up, you two, said Wood. This is the best team Gryffindor's had in years. We're going to win. I know it. He glared at them all as if to say, or oh, else. Right, it's time. Good luck, all of you. Harry followed Fred and George out of the changing room and, hoping his knees weren't going to give way, walked onto the pitch to loud cheers. Madame Hooch was refereeing. She stood in the middle of the pitch, waiting for the two teams, her broom in her hand. Now, I want a nice fair game, all of you, she said, once they were all gathered around her. Harry noticed that she seemed to be speaking particularly to the Slytherin captain, Marcus Flint, a fifth year. Harry thought Flint looked as if he had some troll blood in him. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the fluttering banner high above, flashing Potter for president above the crowd. His heart skipped and he felt braver. Mount your brooms, please. Harry climbed onto his Nimbus 2000. Madame Hooch gave a loud blast on her silver whistle. Fifteen brooms rose up, high, high into the air, and they were off. And the quaffle is taken immediately by Angelina Johnson to Gryffindor. What an excellent chaser that girl is, and a rather attractive too. Jordan! Sorry, Professor. The Weasley's twins, friends, Lee Jordan, was doing the commentary for the match, closely watched by Professor McGonagall. And she's really belting along up there. A neat pass to Alicia Spinnett, a good find of Oliver Woods. Last year, only a reserve. Back to Johnson. And, oh, no, Slytherin have taken the quaffle. Slytherin captain Mark Flint gains the quaffle and off he goes. Flint flying like an eagle up there. He's going to sco Oh, no, stopped by an excellent move by Gryffindor keeper Wood. And Gryffindor take the quaffle. That's Chaser Katie Bell of Gryffindor there. Nice dive around Flint. Off up the field and, ouch, that must have hurt. Hit in the back of the head by a bludger. Quaffle taken by Slytherin. That's Adrian Pusey speeding off towards the goalpost, but he's blocked by a second bludger sent his way by Fred or George Weasley. Can't tell which. Nice play by the Gryffindor beater anyway. And Johnson back in possession of the Quaffle. A clear field ahead and off she goes. She's really flying. Dodges a speeding bludger. The goalposts are ahead. Come on now, Angelina. Keep her blood. She dives. Misses. Gryffindor score! Gryffindor's chest filled the cold air with howls and moans from the Slytherin. Budge up there. Move along. Hagrid. Ron and Hermione. Hermione squeezed together to give Hagrid enough space to join them. Been watching from me hut, said Hagrid, patting a large pair of binoculars round his neck. But it isn't the same as being in the crowd. No sign of the snitch yet? No, nope, said Ron. Harry hasn't much to do. Keep out of trouble, that. Keeping out of trouble, though, that's something, said Hagrid, raising his binoculars and peering skywards at the speck that was Harry. Way above them, Harry was gliding over the game, squinting about for some sign of the snitch. This was part of his and Wood's game plan. Keep out of the way until you catch sight of the snitch. We don't want you attacked before you have to be. When Angelina had scored, Harry had done a couple of loop -de loops to let out his feelings. Now he was back to staring around for the snitch. Once he caught sight of a flash of gold, but it was just a reflection from one of the Weasley's wristwatches. And once the bludger decided to come pelting his way, more like a cannonball than anything, but Harry dodged it. Fred Weasley came chasing after it. All right there, Harry, he had time to yell as he beat the bludger furiously towards Marcus Flint. Slytherin in possession, Lee George was saying, Chaser Pusey ducks two bludgers, two Weasleys and Chaser Bell and speeds towards the... Wait a minute, was that the snitch? A murmur ran through the crowd as Adrian Pusey dropped the quaffle, too busy looking over his shoulder at the flash of gold that had passed his left ear. Harry saw it. In a great rush of excitement, he dived downwards after the streak of gold. Slytherin seeker Terence Higgs had seen it too. Neck and neck, they hurtled towards the snitch. All the chasers seemed to have forgotten what they were supposed to be doing as they hung in midair to watch. Harry was faster than Higgs. He could see the little round ball, wings fluttering, darting up ahead, so he put on an extra spurt of speed. Wham! A roar of rage echoed from the Gryffindors below. Marcus Flint had blocked Harry on purpose, and Harry's broom spun off course, Harry holding on for dear life. Foul! screamed the Gryffindors. Madame Hooch spoke angrily to Flint and then ordered a free shot at the goalposts for Gryffindor. But in all the confusion, of course, the golden snitch had disappeared from sight again. 
Down in the stands, Dean Thomas was yelling, send him off, ref, red card. This isn't football, Dean, Ron reminded him. You can't send people off in Quidditch. And what's a red card? But Hagrid was on Dean's side. They ought to change the rules. Flynn could have knocked Harry out of the air. Lee Jordan was finding it difficult not to take sides. So, after that obvious and disgusting bit of cheating, Jordan, growled Professor McGonagall. I mean, after that open and revolting foul, Jordan, I'm warning you. All right, all right. Flint nearly kills the Gryffindor seeker, which could happen to anyone, I'm sure. So a penalty to Gryffindor, taken by Spinnet, who puts it away no trouble, and we continue play. Gryffindor still in possession. It was as Harry dodged another bludger, which went spinning dangerously past his head, that it happened. His broom gave a sudden, frightening lurch. For a split second, he thought he was going to fall. He gripped the broom tightly with both his hands and knees. He'd never felt anything like that. It happened again. It was as though the broom was trying to book him off. But Nimbus 2000s did not suddenly decide to book their riders off. Harry tried to turn back towards the Gryffindor goalposts. He had half a mind to ask Wood to call time out, and then he realised that his broom was completely out of control. He couldn't turn it. He couldn't direct it at all. It was zigzagging through the air, and every now and then making violent swishing movements which almost unseated him. Lee was still commentating. Slytherin in possession. Flint with the quaffle. Passes spin. It passes bell. Hit hard in the face by a bludger. Hope it broke his nose. Oh, I'm joking, Professor. Slytherin score. Oh, no. The Slytherins were cheering. No one seemed to have noticed that Harry's broom was behaving strangely. It was carrying him slowly higher away from the game, jerking and twitching as it went. I don't know what Harry thinks he's doing, Hagrid mumbled. He stared through his binoculars. If I didn't know better, I'd say he'd lost control of his broom. But he can't have, can he? Suddenly, people were pointing up at Harry all over the stands. His broom had started to roll over and over with him only just managing to hold on. Then the whole crowd gasped. Harry's broom had given a wild jerk and Harry swung off it. He was now dangling from it, holding on with one hand. Did something happen to it when Flint blocked him? Seamus whispered. Can't have, Hagrid said, his voice shaking. Can't nothing interfere with a broomstick except powerful dark magic. No kid could have done that to a Nimbus 2000. At these words, Hermione seized Hagrid's binoculars, but instead of looking up at Harry, she started looking frantically at the crowd. What are you doing, moaned Ron, grey faced. I knew it, Hermione gasped. Snape, look. Ron grabbed the binoculars. Snape was in the middle of the stands opposite them. He had eyes fixed on Harry and was muttering non-stop under his breath. He's doing something. Jinxing the broom, said Hermione. What should we do? Leave it to me. Before Ron could say another word, Hermione had disappeared. Ron turned the back binoculars back on Harry. His broom was vibrating so hard it was impossible for him to hang on much longer. The whole crowd were on their feet watching, terrified as the Weasleys flew up to try and pull Harry safely onto one of their brooms. But it was no good. Every time they got near him, the broom would jump higher still. They dropped lower and circled beneath him obviously hoping to catch him if he fell. Marcus Flynn seized the quaffle and scored five times without anyone noticing. Come on, Hermione, Ron muttered desperately. Hermione had fought her way across to the stand where Snape stood and was now racing along the row behind him. She didn't even stop to say sorry as she knocked Professor Quirrell headfirst into the row in front. Reaching Snape, she crouched down, pulled out her wand and whispered a few well-chosen words. Bright blue flames shot from her wand onto the hem of Snape's robe. It took perhaps 30 seconds for Snape to realise that he was on fire. A sudden yell told her she had done her job. Scooping the fire off him into a little jar in her pocket, she scrambled back along the road. Snape would never know what had happened. It was enough. Up in the air, Harry was suddenly able to clamber back onto his broom. Neville, you can look, Ron said. Neville had been sobbing in a Hagrid's jacket for the last five minutes. Harry was speeding towards the ground when the crowd saw him clap his hand to his mouth as though he was about to be sick. He hit the pitch on all fours, coughed, and something gold fell into his hand. I've got the snitch, he shouted, waving it above his head and the game ended in complete confusion. He didn't catch it. He nearly swallowed it. Flint was still howling 20 minutes later, but it made no difference. Harry hadn't broken any rules, and Lee Jordan was still happily shouting the result. Gryffindor had won by 170 points to 60. Harry heard none of this, though. He was being made a cup of strong tea back in Hagrid's hut with Ron and Hermione. It was Snape, Ron was explaining. Hermione and I saw him. He was cursing your broomstick, muttering. He wouldn't take his eyes off you. Rubbish, said Hagrid, who hadn't heard a word of what had gone on next to him in the stands. Why would Snape do something like that? Harry, Ron and Hermione looked at each other, wondering what to tell him. Harry decided on the truth. I found out something about him, he told Hagrid. He tried to get past that three-headed dog at Halloween. It bit him. We think he was trying to steal whatever it's guarding. Hagrid dropped the teapot. How do you know about Fluffy, he said. Fluffy? Yeah, he's mine. Bought him off a Greek chappy I met in the pub last year. I lent him to Dumbledore to guard the... Yes, said Harry eagerly. Now, don't ask me any more, said Hagrid gruffly. That's top, top secret, that is. But Snape's trying to steal it. Rubbish, said Hagrid again. Snape's a Hogwarts teacher. He's doing nothing of the sort. 
So why did he just try and kill Harry, cried Hermione. The afternoon's events certainly seem to have changed her mind about Snape. I know a jinx when I see one, Hagrid. I've read all about them. You've got to keep eye contact, and Snape wasn't blinking at all. I saw him. I'm telling you, you're wrong, said Hagrid hotly. I don't know why Harry Broom acted like that, but Snape would try and kill a student. Now listen to me, all three of you. You're meddling in things that don't concern you. It's dangerous. You forget that dog, and you forget what it's guarding. That's between Professor Dumbledore and Nicholas Flamel. Aha, said Harry. So there's someone called Nicholas Flamel involved, is there? Hagrid looked furious with himself. Thank you for joining me, and I'll be back tomorrow with Chapter 12, The Mirror of Erised.